right. Hey, everybody. Nice to see everybody here again. Um, so just uh, for, the, for the folks that are on the live stream, just a quick introduction for myself. Uh, my name is Scott DeLandy. I am part of the product management team for the storage division uh, based out of Hopkinton, Massachusetts. So part of the, um, the initial EMC team, now Dell EMC team. Um, been with EMC and now Dell EMC for going on uh, actually 28 years. Um, so 28 years with the, with the same organization, if you would. If you're trying to do the math, yeah, I, I was about 11 when I started, so, so that, you know, that kind of <laughs> factors in. Um, so quick, quick question, question for you folks. So how many people here have in the past experienced hands-on or just kind of a good knowledge of, of Symmetrics VMAX from, from back in the day? So we've got a, a few hands going up here. Um, how many folks would say that they have limited uh, knowledge of VMAX, what it is, what, what people use it for, types of use cases, those types of things. So a little bit more, more than that. So, well, the, the, uh, the good news is, is for the folks that aren't familiar, hopefully at the end of this session, you guys will have a better understanding of, of what, the, what the technology it is, um, um, why customers uh, use VMAX in their environment, and uh, what are some of the uh, very common use cases for how that technology gets deployed. Um, for the folks that are familiar with the product already, um, the good news is that you don't have to learn anything new. The bad news is that you're going to have to forget or unlearn a lot of the things that you know from some of the older platforms. Because um, I think what you'll see is that when you look at the technology and how it's evolved over the last several years, there's been some significant changes in terms of the architecture, in terms of the software, in terms of the management, even in terms of the things like the go-to-market and, and how we package the system uh, from a hardware and software perspective. So we're going to get into those things. And I know I don't have to say this because I know it's going to come anyway. So as we get into the discussion, questions, thoughts, um, please go ahead and, uh, and throw those out. Um, I start here just to kind of talk a little bit about sort of the, the heritage of the platform. So when you think about VMAX and what was previously the symmetric systems, these were technologies that were initially introduced in the late 80s, right? That's how far back this platform goes, right? And it is still a very relevant technology today for many IT organizations. It still represents kind of the core of what their infrastructure is built around. And when you think about that from a historical perspective, right, how many technology examples can you think of that are that old, right, that have that kind of legacy? And, and we talk about this a lot. And really, you know, you think of things other than mainframes and in, in, in VMAX symmetrics, there aren't any examples that, that we can easily come up with. I'm sure if you guys were to, to sit around and think about it, you guys could probably come up with a couple of other things. But it, it is, again, the legacy of the platform. And, when I, when I go out and I talk to, to, to customers and users, and I spend most of my time doing that these days, um, the one consistent feedback that I hear from them is the reason why that they run VMAX and why they will continue to run VMAX is because of the availability, the rock solid um, reliability of the platform, the serviceability of the system, the way we're able to do non-disruptive upgrades, both on the hardware and the software side. There's just a tremendous amount of trust that people have built up with that platform over years. And if there's one piece of feedback that I consistently get from these users is never, ever, ever do anything to compromise that. Because the types of applications and the workloads that I run are the things that support my business. And I need to know that they are going to perform the way they're supposed to. And that's why I continue to invest in this type of infrastructure. So it's a, a key piece of, of, of feedback that, again, that we very consistently get from the, uh, from the user base out there. Now, one of the things that's changed, OK, is the packaging of the platform. Right? When you think of you know, the older symmetric systems and even some of the, uh, the older VMAX systems when they were first um, introduced, kind of the design goal around that platform was to have this scale-out technology. Right? I want to be able to bring something in that's kind of you know, what I need from a scale perspective, from a performance perspective, from a capacity perspective. But I want to have headroom for growth because I don't know if I'm going to grow 30% over the next couple of years or if I'm going to go 300%. So I want to make sure that I'm investing in a platform that gives me the ability to scale that out and get bigger if I need to. Okay? And, and we still have users that, that do that today. That that's a, a, a continues to be a very common way 
around um, how folks deploy the technology, right? Start small, but have the ability to get big. But when you think of where we are from a performance and a capacity standpoint with the density of the systems that we have available today, we're starting to get to that point where I don't know if I need to go that big, right? So, so for example, we introduced a smaller <coughs> package system. It's a 250, right? So this is a system that has, starts with two controllers, can scale up to four controllers, right? Roughly about a petabyte of effective capacity can be installed into that system. The larger 950 system, that's a 2 to 16 controller system, okay? That can go up to about four petabytes of effective capacity. When I talk to users out there, I don't find a lot of them that want to put four petabytes of anything into a single system, right? They're comfortable with, you know, hundreds, sometimes several hundreds of terabytes of capacity in a single piece of storage footprint. And from there, they want to be able to add on additional platforms. So the trend that we're starting to see is that, you know, the 250 and kind of the smaller version is starting to create a really good sweet spot out there for users that want to go to this kind of a, what, I, what I refer to as sort of a storage pod type of a deployment, right? They need some amount of capacity, say four or 500 terabytes, right? They've got their applications, they've got their host environments, they want to get everything set up and they want to have it in place. They want some headroom, right? They want to be able to add some more capacity. They want to be able to, to, to grow the system. Um, but they're not looking to take that system and to be able to double the performance of it, for example, right? They just want some capacity for growth, right? So that system makes a lot of sense for them because they can bring that in run it for a couple of years, and then if they need more, they can just bring in another system, right, and be able to run that side by side. And it's interesting because one of the things that's changed, especially as workloads and environments began to become more virtualized, the challenges that you had in managing physical environments, right, where, yeah, there was a lot of value associated with consolidating, because if I can consolidate, that means I'm managing fewer things. They're bigger, but they're fewer, so there's some simplification, there's some standardization. Um, it's easier because I can run everything um, across a common set of software, common management, all of these types of things were very, very attractive. But as we began to move into more virtualized environments, it shifted a little bit because management got easier because things became much more automated. Um, mobility became a lot easier because if I had something that was over here and I wanted to physically move it over here, because the application was virtualized, I had other tools that I could use that allowed me to do that much easily, much more easily and, and way less disruptive than some of the things that had been available in the past. So, so again, it's, it's interesting if you look at kind of the sweet spot and where we're going with the technology, we're very much going kind of down market because that's really where the growth is. That's where we're starting to see more and more users looking to deploy. Again, not necessarily wanting to bring in these large systems, although we do have lots of users that do that and want to continue to do that. But we also have users out there that want to kind of start small and have a little bit of growth, but not look to double the size that of the system. That want the symmetric level of RAS at much smaller capacities? Uh, yes. So the difference is it's, it's, it's still a multi-controller system. So you have four controllers, up to four controllers within that. They all run active-active. The difference would be is if I had a 16 controller machine, okay? If one of those controllers becomes unavailable, I lose 1 16th of my horsepower. Yeah. If I have a four controller machine and one of those controllers becomes unavailable, I lose 1 4th. So there's some differences in terms of sizing, the resiliency and the availability, all those things are exactly the same. Um, but from a performance perspective, is this something that's going to impact the environment? Well, it depends on how hard you're pushing the machine. If you're and, and if I've got four controllers, all of the devices are available directly to all the controllers? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get under the covers. I've got some architectural slides that okay. we'll take a look at. But yes, very much um, the tradition in terms of the, the redundancy and um, being able to have um, components go offline or being replaced or being serviced or whatever um, without impacting the, the availability in many cases, the performance of the, um, of the applications, right? That, that absolutely continues to be true. Um, so when you look at, again, just to kind of shine a light on, on the 250, right? When, when we go into environments, right, where we're doing technology refreshes, and we've got, we've got systems in there that are four, five, six years old, right? You think about the available technologies at the time, most, most of that was, was based on um, spinning uh, drives, 
right? Lower capacity spinning drives, certainly than what we can do with the flash technology that we have available today. So no surprise to anybody in the room. If I go out and I take a, an asset that's several years old and I bring in something new, I'm going to get a higher performing system. I'm going to get something that's much more <coughs> dense in terms of the capacity and the performance that I'm going to put into a, foot in, in, into a single system. I'm going to get a lot of efficiency out of it as well, right? So one of the things that we've done is we've shifted away from systems that support mechanical drives to systems that are based on all flash technology. <coughs> so when we move into these all flash systems, there are some things that we can do around space efficiency that allow us to get um, um, more presentable capacity out of the front end but require less physical capacity to actually be in the system. So data reduction technologies like compression is a good one. <coughs> we rolled out compression um, um, well over a year ago, year and a half ago now. <coughs> Um, and we're seeing extremely good results with our compression technology. Typically, it's about a two to one data reduction for the types of data sets that we typically see going on a VMAX type of a platform. So think transactional um, types of workloads. We also see um, um, consistent performance, right? So for workloads that weren't compressed with an all flash and we turn compression on, they perform exactly the same. A lot of that has to do with the way that the data reduction was implemented in the system as an inline data service and something that was designed around making sure that we continue to preserve the performance and the low latency that you expect with an all flash system. So it's, it's gotten much better, right? And, and again, no surprise to folks in the room, right? So if you look at flash technology and how it's matured, um, over the last several years, certainly since it was initially introduced, um, the cost points have come down with, with the associated flash media. Um, the uh, capacity points have gotten larger, right? The drives are denser. It gives us the ability to pack more capacity into a so, smaller footprint. Yes? Help me out with this. Absolutely. I've owned a few VMAXs. Well, I haven't owned a few. Organizations I've worked for have okay, owned. Okay, I've owned a SIM. Yeah, I've not owned a SIM. That, that. I don't have the power. I don't have the power at home to. I don't have three phase power at home. You'd be surprised. You can actually. Uh, it's a funny little story. So we actually have ways of being able to run these systems. We plug them in. When we go to shows. We plug them in off of wall outlets so we can get them to power up. So, so, I've never considered the Vmax a scale out platform. Okay. How help me understand how is Vmax today scale out? When I think of uh, scale out, I think of. Traditionally, when I run out of space in a VMAX, I buy more shelves. Yep. When I think of scale out, I think of adding another VMAX cabinet next to my existing VMAX and manage that as a single system. A single separate system? No, as a yeah. two VMAX arrays as a single system. Okay, yeah. So VMAX today is now scale out in that sense? Yes. Well, it's always, it, so it depends on how far you go back. So when we had the older DMX systems, and you're talking, geez, when was that? that you know, you're talking like the mid-2000s for something like that. Um, that was basically you had a card cage, and in there you plugged in these director boards, but it, you were limited in terms of how many slots you had within mm -hmm. that, right? Um, with the VMAX design, what we introduced is a more modular ability to add um, what we had at the time, what we referred to as engines, and within the engine, you had some associated drives that were kind of packaged together with that, where you could have, start off with a single engine, right, and get 1x performance. Right. Then you could add a second engine, you get 2x performance. Then you could add a fourth engine, you get 4x performance. And that's where the scale-out came from. So scale-out was the ability to add not just performance, but being able to add um, um, front-end connectivity. So front-end, the ability to, to fan in. Uh, so I guess the when I talk to my, what was then an EMC salesperson, moved into a Dell EMC person. When I talk about expanding out my VMAX, it was, okay, you can expand it out to a certain number of engines. Mm -hmm. And so by your definition of scale out is the ability to add additional engines. Correct. Okay. And have a linear scale in terms of performance, capacity, connectivity because connectivity plays into that as well because the more connections I have on the front end, the more front end bandwidth I have, the more connections I have on the back end to the flash, the more back end. So it's not, the, you know, there's multiple dimensions okay. to that. To that, to that it, it, it's, it's just conceptually difficult. So when I walk into my data center, I see a VMAX 
cabinet with yep. engines stacked and then shelves next to it. Yeah, yeah. So cons when you look at it physically, yeah. you don't. I don't physically so associate that as mm. scale out. That's but. that is that is old packaging. Mm -hmm. That is packaging that goes back to. Um, at least two or three generations. I'm an architect. When I walk, walk into the data center, all I see is VMAX. Right. So the, with the cool blue light. <laughs> yeah, with the VLAC. What's yeah, yeah. behind the but what's behind the door? I really right. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. I mean, the, the the truth is, when you say scale out, we think of either a, an extreme I/O kind of architecture, or more likely a shared nothing expand to tens or hundreds of nodes architecture it's, so it's, and so there's there's it's not definition it's connotation yeah so right. financially when you. when a when an engineer came to me and said keith i need to expand the vmax i would normally say okay how many more shelves can we add right and he would say we're at we're at the physical limit we need to buy another storage solution whether that's right. another vmax or so when i've always had this and this is as of recent, maybe a year ago, that there's a limitation to how far I can scale a VMAX out total storage wise. Yep. So that four petabyte limit that you talked about in the overall system, <coughs> the overall scale out limitation would be around four petabytes. Yes, from okay. a capacity, presentable capacity standpoint. Now, with the data reduction that you have, right. you may not need four petabytes of actual physical storage in that mm -hmm. machine to present the four but petabytes. But from a presentation, so once, so the, the blocks of scale out is I can scale out to four petabytes yeah. before I'm looking at buying a second VMAX. Yeah, yeah. So that's absolutely true. What I, what I would say is the, 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 the kind of the deployment and the consumption of that, we're definitely starting to see that shift, right? Because the scale, yes, I want to be able to scale that system out. But now what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing are, are users are coming in and saying, okay, I need more. I need mm -hmm. more stuff, right? And I, and I have this asset that's on the floor that's now two years old, okay? Do I want to go out and add on to an asset that's two years old that I know yeah, I'm going to depreciate? Yeah, four petabytes of storage is a lot of tier one storage. Yes. That, there, if you're not that that's that, a bad thing. Not that it's a bad thing. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah. There's no, I just need, I, I have no pushback or argument. I just want to understand the concept. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Scale out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and because the other thing to think about is that if I have a system that, doesn't grow as big as these larger systems, there are components that I can take out that help reduce the entry cost point. So if I'm going to bring in one of these machines that's designed to go to these 16 controllers, I'm paying up front for some of the infrastructure to be able to scale mm -hmm. that system out. If I say, mm, I'm never going to go there, I don't need the RDMA switches, I don't need the back-end connectivity, I don't need some of those hardware elements that are going to add to the cost of that entire system. So the entry points for those systems become less and become way more attractive if, again, you're not ever planning to push this thing to a four petabyte configuration. Right? That's, kind of, that's kind of the shift, and that's where a lot of the growth is really happening within the platform. We still continue to do very well at the high end, because there are users out there that want four petabytes of stuff in one thing. Um, but, but it was always difficult for us to kind of crack into that lower part of the market that is at the you know, hundreds of terabytes. Yeah, I've, I've been in environments where they have a VMAX just for one application yep. because they want the resiliency. They don't need a four petabyte VMAX. Right. They just want the resiliency so that there's, there's challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the other thing that I would talk to on, on just on the, on, on the flash that we're seeing is that, um, you know, when I talk to users out there, they, they're seeing obviously much better reliability with the technology, right? And that, that's no surprise to anybody in the room. You go from a, a, you know, a system based on magnetic drives that you know, are prone to fail, especially as those drives get older in the environment. We see more replacements because you start to hit the useful life of what that drive is able to do. Um, as we move into the flash media, the flash media is, is more reliable. If you look at kind of the sort of the rough M MBTF numbers from the vendors, the, the mechanical drives are roughly 800,000 hours in terms of mean time between failures. The flash drives are about 2.3 million hours, right? So you're looking at a drive just from a reliability standpoint um, is upwards of 3x more reliable than, than, than the, the, the spinning drives, right? So, so right there, you're going to replace fewer of those drives in a, in a, in a user um, environment. But the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, even if a drive fails, you have redundancy built into that drive through things like RAID protection. Yay, we're going to talk about RAID. Hooray, <laughs> right? 
So RAID is, is nothing new, right? It's a parity-based protection that allows you to have drive failures within a particular group, but have things spread across other drives that makes it make sure that A, not only do you not lose the data, but, the but B, the application is still able to continue, continue to run, right? And the challenge that you have with the spinning media is that as those drives get larger and larger, you're, at, you, you know, you're still limited by kind of the physics of, of the disks, right? You can only rebuild these drives so fast because of how, how quickly you can move data in between the drives to do that rebuild process. And I'll give you some, some field numbers here, right? Um, if we have, you know, large capacity drives in a system, say a two terabyte SATA drive, right? And these are older drives. If that drive fails and I need to go and do a RAID rebuild up against that drive, it's going to take you know, tens of hours, sometimes multiple days, depending on how that drive is set up to basically rebuild the drive. And while that drive is going through that rebuild process, I have to be careful that I don't have other failures impacting that RAID group, because if I do, I could actually have data become unavailable, right? So I want to reduce that window as much as possible to limit the exposure of having multiple things fail, right? When you look at the flash drives that we ship today, the most, the most popular flash drive that we're shipping right now is a 3.84 terabyte drive, right? We RAID protect that drive. If that drive needs to be replaced for whatever reason, the time it takes to spare and rebuild that drive is about 90 minutes, right? So you're going from a drive that, you know, a spinning drive that takes days for a couple of terabytes to a drive that's twice the capacity that takes, you know, significantly less time, minutes or, you know, certainly under a couple hours in order to do that. But the key thing about that is that helps translate into overall higher availability because you've reduced that window of exposure for other things to fail, which could put you into a situation where data becomes unavailable. And it's interesting, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a um, sort of a, a kind of a mini user conference um, back at corporate where we had um, several um, customers come in that have, you know, large investments in, in their VMAX <coughs> platforms. And these are folks that are shifting into all flash systems going forward. And we just asked, it, asked them a general question, you know, what, what are one of the things that surprised you um, in moving into the all flash? And consistently, one of the things that we heard was the reliability and the reduction in the number of driver placements they were seeing, right? Because I think, you know, as Flash started to become um, available in the enterprise, there was all sorts of theories and speculation around cellware and how often am I going to rewrite that drive and am I going to be burning these things out and you don't understand my workloads and we're going to do all of these things. And, and, and when we talked about it and how we implement it, there are a lot of things that we do internally within the system that help maintain the durability of the drive, right? We do write caching, we do write folding, we do write coalescing. There's all these cool little technologies that we've built into the system that allow us to take advantage of these flash drives and to be able to extend the useful life and not burn those out. And that's something that we're definitely seeing from our customer base in terms of sort of the real world experience and the feedback that we're hearing from them. Okay. Um, so moving on. Okay. We will do it this way. So there we go. So one of the other things that's changed. So I mentioned, you know, the, the packaging has changed, the move to all flash, all of those cool technology things, but one of the other things that has resonated extremely well um, with the user base is, is the changes in terms of the packaging, okay? So in the old days, I would go ahead and I would buy my Symmetrics, right, Howard? I'd, I'd roll it in and I'd say, give me some SRDF, right? Because I need these, these applications right here are really important. I want to replicate those over to a second system. And we'd say, okay, Howard, how much, how much of that? I want to replicate them synchronously to a second system in the data center and then asynchronously to a third system Right, and then, and then we, would, we, would take out, we would take out the abacus to basically calculate what that functionality is going to cost you because everything was um, licensed individually, it was all capacity-based, and it was very complex in terms of what's this actually going to cost me, and more importantly, if I we want to add more. We just took wheelbarrows and money and gave them to the EMC guy. Not that that's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> from our perspective, no. no. So, so what we... What we heard, what we well heard, and, and what we heard, and in the, in the point that, that, I, that, I'm, that I'm trying to make, probably not, not not that well, is that you know the functionality it worked really well 
Um, it gave them the ability to support the things that they needed to do for the business, but it was very difficult to consume the technology, right? It was very complicated. It could be very expensive in the environment, and they, and they really wanted a better way of being able to do business with us, right? So we, we sort of changed the way we do software packaging. So today, when you get an all-flash system, there's basically two ways it comes, right? We have you know, sort of the, the starter base package, which is the F package, which includes all the functionality that most users would take advantage of. So things like snapshots, things like thin provisioning, um, things like some of our migration um, software tools, all of those things are basically included in the system, okay? The other advanced features are all available through what we call the FX package, right? So this eliminates all of those individual software tiers and gives me the ability not just to run, you know, SRDFS here and SRDFA here, but if I want to do run SRDF synchronous and asynchronous from a single system, I can now do that and I don't have to license that individually, right? So that's really helped, I think, users appreciate the ability to um, um, have, have a more straightforward way of being able to take advantage of the functionality. And what I can tell you is that it's increasing the amount of adoption that we have out there because now that we've kind of taken away that that tax, if you would, that software tax that was built into the platform and made it, again, something that's just basically included when you bring the, when you bring the, the, uh, the system in. Um, again, it's simplified things and it's really increased the ability for users to adopt and implement the technology because it, it's now you know, very much more affordable and more straightforward in terms of what they're trying to do, right? Um, from a VMware perspective, right? So it's interesting, right? If you think about virtualization, Years ago, right, way back in the, you know, the early 2000s as it started to show up in, in the data center, if you think about where it first showed up, it was test, dev, tier two types of environments. Hey, you know, I have this server infrastructure and, boy, if I could run 20, 20 of these applications on one of these things instead of having to deploy 20 of these individually, you know, I could get more efficiency, I could lower the cost, I could take advantage of some of the functionality around mobility and some of the automation features. And it's sort of how it started. And as people looked at the benefits that they were getting from virtualization, they said, hey, why don't I take these Oracle databases or these SQL databases and why don't I start to look at virtualizing those, right? And there was sort of concern at the time about, well, what about the performance? And is this going to limit me from a scale perspective? And what about all of the data services that I want for doing um, recovery and for, for being able to, um, you know, again, do some of the automation around, around the, uh, the management? And, and in those early days, you know, we worked really hard to make sure that as people began to move virtualization from some of those, you know, test and dev and tier two environments to now virtualizing those core applications, we wanted to help them transition by using some of the capabilities that, that users for years and years were using in the enterprise with, with VMAX. So we were very much in the forefront of helping users kind of shift virtualization into the, uh, the world that we know it today where most of the core applications are, are running under a, uh, a virtualized environment. Right? And when you look at you know, kind of the reasons why, right? so massive consolidation, we do have users out there that have um, massively consolidated tens of thousands of VMs um, into a single platform. Um, we have users up there tipping around 50,000 VMs um, in a single system. So again, the ability to kind of consolidate and collapse those things down into a, into a standardized technology with common management, common replication, all of those types of things, that, that's something that we're able to do, right? The other big thing that, that's really helping is the shift to, to all flash, right? So if you look at you know, some of the, the environments, and, and, and Jody talked about kind of this workload blender where, you know, writes can be spiky, read access, all of these types of things. And when, in the days when we had mechanical-based systems, you know, there was a lot of effort required to go in there and make sure that these were tuned and make sure that as we were seeing spikes, we could go in and identify why those spikes were occurring and what are some of the things that we can do to help flatten those spikes out. We don't see those issues, I wouldn't say at all, but certainly as much. Um, in, a, in, a, in an all-flash system. Not only does it give you, again, a very high level of performance and a very predictable level of, uh, of latency, um, it, 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 it gives you the ability to, to do that without having to do a lot of the administration and management that was required 
um, in, um, in, in, in you know, the disk space or even hybrid based systems. I was out just a, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was talking to a, to a large customer of ours. Um, they're, they've been rolling in you know, all flash systems and you know, we talked about the experience you know, as they're moving from disk based systems or hybrid systems into flash systems, you know, what were some of the efficiencies that they were seeing on the operational side. And the numbers that they're measuring is they say that when they move a workload from, from, from a disk based system to, to an all flash system, they see about a six to one reduction in the amount of administration effort. Right? And a lot of that is just around performance optimization. Right? If, I've got, if I've got systems that are tiered where I've got flash and I've got mechanical drives and I'm trying to figure out which pieces of data belong on this tier and which pieces belong on this tier, I've got all these knobs and levers and things that I have to tweak and pull and try to optimize. And it requires some pretty deep skills to go in there and do that effectively. Moving to all flash gives them the ability to have the single tier, very simple to manage. Matter of fact, their comment to us is that the systems are pretty boring. Because they bring those in, they go from a world of you know, several to tens of milliseconds down to consistently sub-millisecond. All of their users are happy, and other than going in and provisioning a digital storage and just doing some, some basic reporting, there's not a lot for them to do from an administration perspective. So you know, being called boring, I guess, is nice in one way, maybe not as cool in the other way, but that's you know, kind of the, the feedback that, that, that we're hearing. Yeah. The, the other difference th between yeah. boring is when it's Boring or worrying about going out of business, I'll take boring. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to give you your weekend back. I think that's the big thing, right? Um, so from a data efficiency, so, so we talked about the cost of the capacity coming down. We talked about um, um, the efficiencies that are being built into the system with things like data reduction, you know, other classic technologies, thin provisioning, snapshots, all of those <coughs> things. But what we're seeing is moving again from an environment where you've got physical disks and going into an all-flash. It's, it's, it's easily about a four to one um, space efficiency um, improvement over those older systems. So, so again, now you've got this four petabyte machine or 400 terabyte machine, probably more realistic, um, but you're only using 100 terabytes of actual physical capacity to be able to, to present that. So it's a way of being able to reduce the acquisition costs and kind of the ongoing support costs by, by taking advantage of that. And then there's the availability, right? The, the resiliency, the, the things that we do under the covers to make sure um, that the system is always up and your applications are, are always available. Those continue to be some of the top reasons. Um, we do all have um, a number of integration points within VMware as well. Um, I think uh, um, Jody and Todd did a real good job of kind of taking through some of the examples of, of those integration points. They're very similar um, with what we've been doing with VMAX for, for years and years, plugins and APIs and all of that kind of cool stuff. I will say one of the things that we have users that use um, very, um, uh, very commonly deployed is integration with SRM, Site Recovery Manager, because when you look at VMAX systems in particular, um, there is a huge penetration around how many of those systems are being replicated, right? So we have this replication technology. It's been available for years and years called SRDF, right? Stands for Symmetrics Remote Data Facility, okay? Been out there since uh, it was actually first introduced um, back in 1994, if you believe it, okay? And it was back at the name, I'll give you some, some color around the name. So it was back when you know, we were a very engineering driven organization and we let engineers name products. And we thought that it would be cool to have every product come out with a four letter acronym that always began with an S. So it would be symmetric something, 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 right? And that's just how we named products back in the day. So we've had SRDF out there for a number of years and just from a branding perspective, we've always talked about, well, should we rename the product? And the challenge is that there's just so much brand association built up with that four letter acronym, it's very difficult for us to let go and to be able to move on with a new name. But that's where SRDF comes from. So if you're, I know we've thrown that around a couple of times just to give you, again, a little color around the, the, uh, the history of the name. But specifically with SRM, what's cool about this is it allows us to use the, the, um, the data services for remote replication under the covers with VMAX, but from an application or from a VM perspective to be able to use all of the native VM-based tools to kind of manage and control that environment. Right? So it's one of the things that you know, we see a huge adoption for. It's one of those things that you know, in terms of um, um, the amount of qualification and the amount of integration that we do, it's definitely top of the list from an engineering perspective just because so many of our users um, take advantage of that capability. 
Um, from a VM perspective, so again, I mentioned, you know, at, at the high end, you know, the types of customers that are doing tens of thousands, you know, financial services, certainly um, service providers. Um, we have um, some folks in, in what I'll describe as kind of the shipping and logistics type of verticals that are doing these very, very highly virtualized environments that are consolidating like crazy, right? So definitely not a, not a kind of a fake hero number, but certainly something that we're seeing in the real world from a, from a consolidation perspective. Now, are you seeing most of your customers buy the FX software bundle or are they, what, you know, and what? You want the number? It's about half and half. So when we look at what we ship, about half of the folks bring the system in um, with the F and the other half bring it in with FX. And the reason why for the FX is because if you're going to SRDF, if you're going to run the remote replication, it's just way more um, cost effective to bring in the, uh, the FX package because roughly about half of our users do um, um, the remote replication. So it's about half. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but you know what's cool about it is that when you bump into the FX package, and I kind of digress with this, but we also include with that um, um, PowerPath licenses. So PowerPath is our pathing management software. Um, users really love it from a technology perspective. They don't like to have to license it because if they want to PowerPath everything in their environment, that can start to be kind of a costly proposition for them. But having that built into the FX, lic into the FX license um, gives them the ability to, to run that in, in a good chunk of their environment. So we're starting to see um, a lot more adoption of PowerPath because from, a, from an optimization <coughs> perspective around performance and, and channel failover, channel recover, those types of things, it works extremely, extremely well. Um, and, and users love it, but now, again, having to license it when I've got other things that are free and are generally considered good enough, right? That's kind of what we're competing with. So the FX has definitely helped with the um, uh, PowerPath deployments. Well, it's more than that I had to pay for PowerPath. It's that I had to pay for PowerPath in tiny increments. Yep. You know, it's like, I, I just spent $4 million, and you want another 150 bucks because I'm adding another server? It's the nickel and diming more than yeah. the total amount of money. So what I, what I would mm -hmm. tell you, Howard, is that that, that, that comment is, um, is, is, is well, I wouldn't say it's well understood. It's something that we are, we are looking very hard at how do we deal with um, going forward because, you know, we, 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 we still, you know, we still need to, you know, be a business and operate as a business, but we also want to basically make sure that people are getting the full value out of the technology without feeling that, like, yeah, but, but you also have done. to understand situations like I was a consultant at Deloitte. They paid me more to fill out the PO to buy a copy of PowerPath yep. than for the copy of PowerPath. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's relatively easy to get a $4 million PO. That's, but but you know, it's no easier. A, to, but that's the part of a forty million dollars exactly the same amount of work. Trans, yep. But the, to get a, a five hundred licenses spread over three years is way harder. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's. I, I would say. Enterprise mass. It, we 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 recognize that we've 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 put a lot of friction in place for a piece of functionality that adds a lot of a lot into the value. And what I can tell you is that there are there are multiple. Um, work streams going on right now looking at how do we how do we make that better right because that you're not you guys are definitely not the first ones to say it. I hope the corporate people are paying attention to this right because here's another data point for us so that's well, definitely something that I told Joe Tucci personally so hearing listening and hearing and doing are different things yeah no I hear you I hear you but I, you know I, there's there's enough there's enough noise in the system and enough people saying well, the, this has the to get trend, better. The trend is more and more to bundled. Yeah. And you just have to get on the bus. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. <coughs> Definitely something, you know, where we are we are working. Um, and, and you know, we'll 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 make better just how and when you know, those details are still kind of fact, being factored out. So uh, let's, we're going to do a little bit of a geek out here. So um, just because I wanted to make sure that we kind of talked a little bit about sort of the, the operation and how a VMAX works. So, so I mentioned, you know, you've got a 250 and it's a two to four controller machine and you've got this 950, which is a um, um, two to 16 controller system. When I crack that thing open, that controller, actually we internally refer to it as a director, but to the outside world it's a controller, it's a node, you know, there are multiple synonyms that you can use to describe it. But you basically have this, this thing that has compute on it, okay? And the way we have it designed is we have um, a number of cores that are allocated across that, that controller. Um, some of those cores, the job is to talk to the front end and basically service I.O. that's coming from the host. 
Some of those cores are on the back end and used to move I.O. back and forth between the flash media. And then some of those cores are used for the data services, for, so for doing things like um, um, uh, replication or for doing something like file <coughs> services, okay? You know, if I want to take a, this block-based system and I want to carve up, you know, 20 terabytes of, of file data, um, I run that data service um, internally within the system. I know I was talking to some folks last night. Back in the day, they kind of cut their teeth around um, Solera system. So Solera was one of our early on generation products that allowed us to take a, a Symmetrics at the time, VMAX today, and to basically put some controllers in front that allowed us to do file presentation. The new systems, we can still do block and file, but we no longer have that hardware requirement. We no longer have to put something physically connected into the system to provide that file presentation. It runs as a data service natively within the platform. Right? But across these cores, the cores are dynamically allocated. Right? And, and what that means is if I have you know, a core, and just to keep the math simple, if I can do 10,000 IOs up against each of these individual cores, and I've got eight cores, that means I can push 80,000 IOs across the front end. I can do that across all the ports. I can do that across a single port. I basically am going to go in and dynamically load balance the front end and the back end, and even the data services running within the system. And that's a big, the reason why I put this in is because that is one of the biggest architectural changes that we've made over the last several years. Older systems didn't have this ability to do that. So in many cases, there were a lot of rules of thumb that were in the field around how I do performance optimization around the back end <coughs> and the front end of the system. And the point that I wanted to make with this slide is that those rules no longer exist. Right? They've gotten much simpler because the system does a better job of basically automating that performance management and taking it out of having to worry about you know, how I'm doing my zoning and how I'm cabling things in and how many paths I need from a particular host, et cetera, et cetera. That got much better. Now, from an architecture, so getting to the kind of the scale out point, I was going to jump forward to this and I said, nope, I'm going to wait and we'll, 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 we'll talk about it when we get there, right? So here's that, here's that same um, um, dual controller system, right? So this is what we would call today a single VBRIC. I can run that as a single VBRIC. The way the system works is it's a cache-based system, okay? So we have this global memory that's shared across the two controllers within this system. And what it does is it caches I.O. And the way it works is every time a write request comes into the system, that write lands into the cache, it's mirrored over to the other cache, and then we tell the host, we've got the I.O., go ahead and, you know, send your next I.O., go do whatever you're going to do next, right? So, so we no longer hold the, the right up until it hits the media on the back and we just take it into the cache and away we go. And the reason why that's important is that the disk service time on that is, is sub millisecond. Matter of fact, in most cases, it's sub half millisecond in order to complete that operation. So it's really, really fast, okay? So writes get cached within the system. The majority of the read I.O. also gets cached, right? So I go ahead and I want to read a piece of data. I'm going to look in the cache and I'm going to say, is that data in the cache, right? Because of the caching algorithms that we run in the system, we do a pretty good job of understanding what the active data sets are and where they need to go, whether they belong in cache or whether we can put those out onto the flash drives on the back end of the system. Generally speaking, when we look at the real world, we typically see systems getting 50, 60, 70 percent cache hits. That's across both read and write operations. Now, obviously, your mileage will vary depending on the application, read, write, profile, block size. I mean, all those variables come into place. But when I look kind of, you know, install base wide, um, more than half of the systems are getting better than 50% cache hits across that. So that means they're getting really, really good performance, whether they have flash in the system or not, because most of that I.O. is being serviced out of the cache, right? So same thing. So now if I go ahead and I read a piece of data, I'll go ahead, I'll look at it, see if it's in the cache. If it's in the cache, great, right? I'll take the data and I'll just present it back up to the host, right? So again, half a millisecond in order to perform that operation. If it's not in the cache, then I've got to go find it. Now I've got to go and read it off of the media, right? And this is where the big change happened going from the mechanical drives into the flash drives because in order to perform that operation with a mechanical drive, that could take tens of milliseconds in order to do that because your mechanical drives, depending on what flavor drives you had, 
could be really, really slow, right? We put the cache in there years ago when you didn't have flash in order to minimize the performance impact by trying to move more and more things out of cache versus having to move the data um, all the time off of the physical drives. The move to flash has made that much better because now you're only talking hundreds of microseconds in order to basically be able to read the data from the flash into the cache and then back up to the host. So that's where kind of the performance comes from. But the, the way the memory works is that you know, we maintain everything within the memory. It is, it is a globally shared um, um, pool of memory, so it's accessible in a single vBrick configuration across both of those directors, right? They both run active-active. They can see each other's cache. And again, they're mirroring the data between those caches from an availability perspective. When I add a second engine into the system, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to have a couple of InfiniBand switches that I'm going to connect those into, and I'm going to run RDMA, which is going to allow each of those controllers to access the other controllers over that high-speed um, memory fabric, right? And it kind of works that way as I add, you know, all the way up to, you know, four engines, six engines, eight engines, you know, as I continue to scale that out, right? And what we see is, again, as we talked about, you know, very predictability in terms of the performance improvements as I scale that, those systems forward. So what was 1x with a single V-brick is 2x with 2, 4x with 4, 8x, so on and so forth. So that's what gives folks that, that um, 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 predictability in terms of the scale and the performance that they can get out of the system, okay? Um, so from an availability perspective, so there's lots of cool things that we do under the covers. Um, so from a um, hardware resiliency perspective, you know, do, do, you know, do boards need to be replaced? Do power uh, supplies go bad? Uh, do, do batteries um, um, need to be replaced? All that stuff happens. And, and the system is always designed to be fault tolerant. So any of those components or multiples of those components can go offline and can go be serviced without any impact to the availability of the performance of the application. So all of that hardware resiliency continues to be there. One of the things that we do very differently is the way we do uh, upgrades in the system. And I'm going to, hardware upgrades, being able to add things and plug new things in and add more drives and add more engines, all of those things are, are, as you would expect, to be non-disruptive. But one of the unique things that we do in the environment is the way we do microcode upgrades, okay? A lot of multi-controller systems, when they do controller upgrades, what they'll do is they'll have their controller, they'll add the new code to one controller, they'll basically fail that controller under the covers and reboot it so that it comes back up with the new code, and they stagger this across all of the controllers that they have in that system. So that process um, can take a while, depending on how large the system is and how long it takes to reboot each of those individual controllers. Um, when I do that, that controller becomes offline. So I need to have multi-pathing across everything, because when I do that, the path to that controller that's being upgraded is basically going to go unavailable. Its status will say, I'm no longer here. Find somebody else to talk to your data, because I'm doing something. right? Um, so it, it's not, again, for a lot of environments, it's OK, right? because you know, they have maintenance windows and they have things that they can get away with that you know they, they can they can um, um, go through these processes and and for the types of things that they're running they can negotiate maintenance windows and and, and be able to do that in, in in our world in some of the environments that we run in there's just no maintenance windows there are no off hours to basically be able to do this and if you think at some of these highly consolidated environments where I've got tens of thousands of applications running on a single system the ability to go out and find a maintenance window where, hey, can I shut this whole thing down or put you in a degraded mode for some hours of period of time in order to do this is just really, really hard to do. <coughs> so one of the reasons why users love their VMAX is because of the ability for us to do a non-disruptive upgrade. The way the process works is we'll go ahead and we'll add, add, apply the new microcode into the system. And then while I.O. is running, we'll go in and we'll pause the I.O will reflash the, the processors and then resume the I.O. We don't ever go offline. The system never goes offline during that process. And the time it takes is, is nearly unnoticeable from the host in the application. And it goes across the entire system. So because of that, it makes it very easy to upgrade to the latest versions of code. It also makes it very easy if for some reason you need to downgrade to an older version for whatever, you know, for whatever reason that that might happen. But when I talk to users, this is definitely one of the 
things that they tell us is a differentiating factor in their environment, the way we're able to do these types of code loads, and the fact that, you know, they get their weekends back, right? We hear this all the time. You know, I had this thing in here, and, you know, every time I needed to upgrade, we'd have to come in, you know, Saturday night, and it would take eight hours because we had to sit there and be on site to do this, and we have multiples of these frames, and it just becomes, you know, not just operationally a difficult thing, just people just get sick of doing that. And they don't deal with that within the world within VMAX. And one of the things that this really helps us out with, it's an important thing to, to point out, is that, you know, you have a software out there. You have software patches, right? There we have these things called EPACs where we find, oh, we hear something within the code, we need to push an EPAC out there, and we need to get this fix applied in the field because there are users that are potentially exposed to this, this bug that we found. And in some environments, they look at this and they say, okay, I know I have to apply this patch, but my maintenance window isn't for another X amount of weeks, right? So I'm going to run in, in, in what I know is, 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 is a, mo unless, unless it's an absolute critical patch, which is, hey, you have to shut this down and you have to get this applied. But for some of these patches, I know I'm running in a, in a mode where I am potentially vulnerable to this until I can get to that next maintenance window so I can go ahead and apply uh, a fix to the system. The, the thing that we see is because we've taken a lot of the pain out of doing those types of upgrades, our user base, not only do they stay current with any software patches that get released, but they stay very current with the latest software releases in general, right? So they can take advantage of the fixes that get bundled into that, but they can also take advantage of the newer functionality that gets rolled out because, again, it's easier for them to apply these types of upgrades into the environment. Right, so, so very consistently one of the things that we hear all the time as a, as a feature that users love about the VMAX. It's not just you know, the availability and the resiliency and all the things from a hardware perspective, that's there, but it's the, the, the differentiation that we've done around the software and how we're able to do those types of upgrades. Right, so yeah. with regards to the process for that upgrade, yep. we're, we're feasibly upgrading all of the controllers at, at once. Yep. Um, What's what's the uh, what's the failback process if there's a defect in the code that we didn't know about? Um, so um, how how long does it take to get the software to the point where you're switching back? Same amount of time. So what we do is we flash the code across all of the processors at once, boom, and then if we need to go back in, we can revert that process in, in in the system. Those things are generally done by a part of the organization that we refer to as Rempro, Remote Proactive Services, and this is a team of people that. You know, they do, this is all they do. This is so, and, and just, to, this, is, this is like a medical process. This is like going in for surgery. We just don't take the code, and it's not like, you know, hey, there's a, you know, a new click here to install the software, and you click there, and you, where you go. That's not how it works, right? There are pre checks that are done through the system. We run all these scripts, we validate those upgrades, we make sure that all the, everything is healthy in the system, and, and there's all kinds of pre checks that go into place before that code gets applied in, into the system. But once, again, it's applied, there's, there's no disruption to the environment to actually apply those. And in the rare case, very rare case, that you need to go back for whatever reason, there's the ability to do that. Um, that that's something that's been built in. And it's kind of a, a legacy thing that was put in years and years and years ago, but it's still something that you can do today. Rarely, rarely, rarely ever happens, but it's definitely one of the mechanisms that's built into that. So, so the actual upgrade is not in user performable. It's performed by the, the RIM Pro folks. Um, so for, 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 the, for the general user community, not like the, the secret society of other folks that are out there, um, yes, those are things that are done by um, um, the EMC folks. That's part of the, the, you know, the, 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 the standard um, um, support um, um, you know, process that they get when they, bring in, when they bring the system in. Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and being that it's a VMAX, and given what you're probably running on there, you probably want that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. This is, again, it's like, when we, it's, it's the, like going in for surgery where, you know, you walk into a different room and they keep checking your, are you who you are, right? right? All those checks, and you're like, well, they just checked it there. Well, I'm going to check it again, and they're going to check it 10 more times. It's that sort of, you know, pre-check that goes through the, uh, through the process. Um, and, 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 again, very consistently, users will tell us you know, this is, this, in, in their mind, is, is, is a, a key reason why they, um, why, they, why they leverage the technology, and they know it works. They know it works. They know there's a very solid process that's baked in around that. So uh, Jody showed the slide, so I, I won't go too deep into it, but we've got 
uh, our local replication and the ability to do, I'm going to call it snapshot-based management. I'm not going <laughs> to bite off on that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you will see no ICDM on this slide. Um, we also have, um, you know, the integration. The integration within, within. Well, I'm um, glad for no ICBMs. They're really dangerous. <laughs> uh, ICDM. <laughs> Intelligent copy data management. Right. We don't, we don't want to talk about the bombs just yet. Um, so protect point is is a really cool feature, and, I, I, and, and Jody did a good job describing kind of the the under the covers of how it works. The use case for this there's a very there's a very specific use case for why somebody would deploy this type of a technology, and that's for large scale databases. Okay, if you've got a large database and you need to back that up, you know you've got to worry about your backup windows, right? If I've got a 40 terabyte Oracle database. That's going to take you know tens of hours in order to back that up. Matter of fact, that's going to take tens of days to back that could, up. It could, I, I, so I have a customer that I work with down in, in South America, and they had a 40 terabyte um, um, database, and it was taking them about 30 hours to back up, which exceeds a 24-hour backup window. So they were over a day in terms of potential data loss just because of you know, the, the, the backup windows that, 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 that they were given because of the technology that they had in place. They brought in ProtectPoint into the environment and that 90, that 30-hour um, 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 uh, backup window went down to 90 minutes, right? Because what we're doing is we're basically sending a snap, creating a snapshot on the array, kicking that snapshot off into data domain. Into data domain, it looks like a traditional backup. So it gets cataloged, it gets managed, it gets deduped, it does all of that cool stuff that the data domain does. But you're no longer traversing the backup infrastructure for doing those backups, and more importantly, for doing those restores, because you're coming off of dedicated fiber channel SAN connections, which have higher bandwidth. And again, you're using some of the efficiencies connected between the, uh, the two technologies. But that, again, big, big use case for us is for those large scale databases, this starts to make a lot of sense, especially if you're starting to exceed um, some of those windows in terms of not just the backup, but what can be recovered. But the other thing I want to talk about is, is the remote replication. So again, SRDF, Symmetrics Remote Data Facility, you know, we'll, we'll discuss if anybody has any ideas around a better name for the product, we're, we're open to that. Um, we'll see what we can do. But um, So we've had sync and async modes of, of replication available for what seems like 100 years now, right? <laughs> Um, and um, the way that replication has always worked is I have a, a source copy and I have a target copy. One copy is active, the other copy is offline. And I write to the source and then I write it over to the target and if it's within a synchronous distance, I can put both copies in the same place and acknowledge the I.O. So if something goes bad, I've got a secondary copy that I can recover up against and the, the potential for data loss is, is, is not there because everything runs synchronously. If I have extended distances and I have to worry about the latency latencies associated with moving that data between those two sites. Now I may need to go to an async mode because I can't slow the application down with tens of milliseconds of additional latency in order to put that, that copy there. But the trade-off is, is I'm getting a copy over hundreds or thousands of miles, but now my recovery point could be seconds or minutes um, behind because I'm running that, that asynchronously. And that's how this stuff has, has worked for years and years. And when you look at kind of your, your choices, right, You've got your RTO, which is your recovery time objective. How long does it take to recover a particular workload? And then you have your RPO, which is your recovery point objective, which is if I do need to recover, what's my exposure for potential data loss? When was the last time I made that copy that I can run up against? Is it seconds? Is it minutes? Is it hours? Is it days? And depending on the type of replication technology you have in place, backup, snapshots, remote replication, that gives you some variation between the RTOs and the RPOs. And by the way, when it comes to backup, for a lot of environments, you know, having one copy every 24 hours is more than what they need, right? For these types of, you know, workloads, that fills, fills perfect, fits perfectly in with the service levels that they're trying to provide from a recoverability. But on the high end, right, you know, if I've got mission critical applications, trading applications, for example, I don't want to lose, you know, any of these transactions because those could be really, really important. So that's why I implement some of these things around remote replication with synchronous. The new um, thing that we introduce, actually not new anymore, it's been out there for a while, is the ability to do active-active replication. So instead of having one site that's active and the second site that, that's offline in there as a recoverable copy, I can have both sides as being active-active, which means I can read and write 
to both of those systems simultaneously. So now if something goes bad, I no longer have to recover the application. I don't have to restart the <coughs> workloads. I just continue to run up against the other side that still remains available. And that could be if a server fails, if a storage array fails, even if there's a site failure, that gives me the ability to continue to, to stay up and running, right? And what we've done is we've taken this active active and we've uh, integrated in with, uh, with VMware, especially with things like ESX clusters. It works really, really well. So what I can do is I can take a cluster and I can stretch it, right? And I can have both sides accessing both, both parts of the storage simultaneously, doing reads and writes. So again, if, 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 the, if the cluster goes offline, if uh, the, the storage goes offline, if the site goes offline, there is no RPO, there is no recovery point because the application continues to resume. But one of the other interesting use cases for this is when I run active active, if I want to do something like a vMotion, a storage vMotion, well actually a, 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 a VMware uh, vMotion, um, those run much, much faster because I no longer have to copy the data, the storage from one site to the other because it's already there. So if I have a VM that's running on site A and I want to move it over to site B and I have this SRDF active active under the covers, it's just a matter of saying take this VM and just move it over there and it takes literally seconds in order to be able to do that. So what could take, you know, a long time, hours, depending on how big that virtual machine is that you want to move, you can get that down to seconds by already having the data there. Because again, you don't have to go through the process of sucking all that data up and pushing it over the network over to the other side because you're already running it there as a recoverable image. Okay, so a lot of adoption for this. This is really a cool piece of technology. The one thing that I would say is that, you know, back in the day to set up SRDF, um, you had to have kind of a PhD level, you know, training in, in, in you know, Sim CLI and just the, the science and, and kind of the wizardry of being able to go ahead and, and get these things set up. And what we've done is we've gone down a path where we've really, really simplified um, the setup and the automation um, for SRDF. It typically takes a couple minutes now to go ahead and set that up, which could have been, you know, again, a, a much more um, labor intensive uh, administration effort to do that in the past. So this Why is I left consulting, you guys made it unprofitable. Ah, uh, sorry, Howard. You know what? We'll find something else to make <coughs> complex for you. We're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just the guys who want that job. We can do that. Okay. So, um, so That's rare uh, I play the straight we'll, we'll man. Click off. <laughs> so, so I did have copy data management in here. So this is snapshot based management because I absolutely get your point, right? It's, this is what happens when marketing gets involved. They want to use all these cool names, but I, I agree with you. We are talking about more snapshot management and automation at, at the application level. But you guys know, right? You guys are making they're making all kinds of copies, and and I think just for the folks that that don't deal with, deal with this. The reason why this is important is that. You know, you go out and you talk to the application guys. And you say, are you making copies? They say, yeah, I'm making copies. I'm doing it for a test. I'm doing it for dev. I'm doing it for training. I'm doing it for a backup. I'm doing it for, uh, you know, a hundred different reasons, right? And I'm using, I'm doing it at the application level because, hey, I've got this, you know, it's a, it's a 40 gigabyte database. And I'm going to make 10 copies of it. So it's 400 <clears throat> gigabytes of capacity. Storage is cheap. It's 400 gigabytes, it's half a terabyte. I can go down to Best Buy, I can get a half a terabyte thumb drive for, you know, I don't know, nine bucks. What's the big deal, right? And the challenge is, is that it's not just this one application that's doing it. It's every one of these applications, hundreds, thousands. So a lot of the capacity that gets chewed up for this replication really, really starts to become expensive. And what we do under the array with the snapshot technology is we don't make full copies like they do at the application level. We make pointer-based copies, which means that the amount of capacity you need for those <coughs> copies is a fraction, right? I don't need a full copy. It's just how much of the data changes, 5%, 10% of the data. So it's a way more efficient way of being able to um, make copies from a, from a space perspective. That's kind of what, what the idea is behind by, by copy data management. I threw this in, this was just to see, you know, who were the, uh, the folks that were around for the 90s Saturday Night Live and remembered the copy guy making copies, remember that? 
<laughs> for, the, for, the, for the younger folks, we can Google that. Um, so we're all making copies is the point. But the other thing that, that's uh, uh, improved is not just the ability to make lots and lots of copies, but to be able to take those copies and to be able to run I.O. up against those and have really, really good performance. Not just good performance for running the I.O. up against the copies, but because it's no longer a full copy, making sure that you're not stepping on the performance for that application. So that's kind of a real big deal, right? A couple, um, you know, we're at, we're at the, the well, actually a little bit past 10 o'clock, but we have some really good customers out there. Um, these are, these are uh, a customer that I, I, I work with um, um, for, for a number of years now, RC Wiley. They are a, um, um, basically a furniture uh, company out of uh, Salt Lake, uh, Utah, and Rich Sheridan uh, is one of the guys that, that we deal with there. And you know he's been a you know Vmax customer for a number of years. He swears by the resiliency. Um, he was an early adopter for the All Flash. He runs uh, a nearly 100% virtualized environment. Um, today, he's seen lots of improvements. The big one is he was getting, you know, he thought he was getting really good performance with his VMAX systems on the hybrid side, and, and actually he was. He was getting four or five milliseconds, and if you've got a mechanical-based system, that's really, really good performance. He moved into the all-flash, and his four to five milliseconds dropped to 0.4 milliseconds. So really, really good results in terms of what he's seeing. And then another customer, and this is a New England-based uh, customer who also we've worked with for a long time, um, Joe Passatori. Um, and this is for Sinius Health. If you don't know who these guys are, uh, it's probably a good thing. Um, these are the guys, they basically manage and administrate about 50% of the dialysis care that happens worldwide, right? And they use VMAX in lots of their parts of their business, but they also use it to basically manage their, their, their patient uh, systems. Um, and what's really important to them is they, they basically have all these dialysis um, um, clinics. And those dialysis machines are really, really expensive, right? So the, what they have to do to the business is they have to make sure that they're getting patients in and out as quickly as possible to make sure that they're maximizing the utilization of all of the dialysis care that they can <coughs> provide. So how quickly a patient checks in, how quickly making sure that everything is ready to go. I mean, that's what they're, they're really focused in on. It's just being able to, to, to get patients in and out. The challenge in their environment, it's interesting, is because it's not like a traditional uh, patient records type of an environment where, you know, if you're, if you're a patient and you go see your doctor, you probably go see your doctor maybe once or twice a year unless something, you know, serious is happening. These guys are a little bit different because in their environment, their patients are coming in three, four times a week for care, and they're coming in for the rest of their lives. So the volumes of information and the amount of growth that they're seeing is just exponentially high. And again, they rely on the VMAX because of the resiliency of the platform, but also because of the headroom it gives them to be able to scale and support that future growth. <laughs>